Joel Morwood describes himself as having been a radical anti-war activist as a young man, later found a profession in uh, documentary film, and worked in Hollywood for some years in movie and TV production. Disillusionment with that lifestyle led to an interest in spirituality which culminated in an awakening. He was invited to Eugene in 86 by Amit Goswami, and together with Goswami's wife at the time, Maggie, uh, founded the Center for Sacred Sciences here, of which he is now the spiritual director. The center does not represent any particular religious viewpoint, but fosters spiritual development and the emergence of a new worldview. That is a synthesis of the synthesis of the best spiritual insight with new paradigm science. Joel is the author of numerous essays, articles, recorded speeches, and two books. It gives me great pleasure to welcome to our meeting tonight, Joel Morwood. Wow, good evening, everybody. Uh, Wonderful introduction by Robert uh, sums it up, and I'm not going to spend any time, uh, more time, talking about the center. If you're interested, we do have some pamphlets over there, and we have a wonderful website you can uh, check out at centerforsacredsciences.org. Is it org? Yes, right. And that will tell you all about us if you want to find out more about us. So I don't want to take up any of your time tonight trying to uh, describe that. Uh, the topic tonight is. Universal Principles of Mysticism and the New Paradigm. And the way I came up with this title is Robert called me on the phone and he said, would you like to give a talk? And I said, sure. And he said, well, what would you like to talk about? And I said, well, how about Universal Principles of Mysticism and the New Paradigm? He says, that's great. And I, I almost was saying it tongue in cheek. And when we hung up, I was kind of horrified. <laughs> But we have a precept at the center to honor our word, so I'm going to try to honor uh, my word to give this talk, and I'm going to try to do it. And we only have, what, about an hour here, and this is really a lot to bite off. I'm not sure I can chew it all up. But if I at least stimulate your interest in some things, if I get you thinking, if I get you questioning or doubting or something like that, I'll consider the evening a success. So I don't expect me to uh, answer any questions. I really, my job is to raise questions. So uh, to begin with, we have to know what a paradigm is. And the way I use the term paradigm is based on the way it was uh, first introduced, at least in our modern meaning, by Thomas Kuhn, who wrote a book uh, in 1961, or at least it was published in 1961, called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Just out of curiosity, how many people here have heard of that book or read that book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions? A few of you. You are familiar with the use of the term paradigm, I assume a lot of you, right? Have you heard that term before? Right. Well, the way you probably are using it is the way Kuhn uh, actually defined it in this book. This is sort of the seminal book uh, that, that brought this term into our language. And he, uh, he identified four factors that make up a paradigm. And I have added a fifth one. I have taken the liberty, the presumption, to add a fifth one. And I just want to describe them to sort of set uh, the scene about what we're talking about. And I've actually written up uh, these five factors on the board here, for those of you who like to take notes or have you know, quick memorization powers. The first one is fundamental assumptions about the nature of reality. Fundamental assumptions. Notice they are assumptions. These are, the, these are like axioms in geometry. You can't prove them, you assume them. They're fundamental assumptions about the nature of reality. So, for instance, in the materialist paradigm, the fundamental assumption about the nature of reality is that it is made up of only matter, energy, and physical forces. If you want to throw in uh, time and space there, you could do that as well. But uh, there are no, for instance, in the materialist paradigm, there is no intelligent designer guiding evolution. 
I'm not taking sides here. I'm just describing the various paradigms. In other paradigms, there is an intelligent designer, but not in a materialist paradigm. Uh, the second is what I call truth criteria. The, the more uh, philosophically technical term might be epistemological criteria, but truth criteria will do. And that is the criteria that we use to determine valid knowledge. So again, in the materialist paradigm, the scientific method is the truth criteria. You have the theories, you conduct experiments, if the experiments verify the theories, then that's valid knowledge. You don't have uh, psychics uh, telling you what's going to happen in the future. That is not, in the materialist paradigm, considered valid knowledge. Again, I'm not taking sides here, I'm just trying to describe uh, the difference of, so we can identify the difference between various paradigms that people hold. Third, technical language. Uh, I think uh, Kuhn calls this symbolic generalizations. I tried to uh, restate his, his uh, principles in more uh, uh, understandable terms. By the way, I, I should say the truth criteria is the one I've added. That was my addition. But technical language. And an example of that is in science, the technical language par excellence is mathematics. So the uh, propositions of science are expressed in terms like E equals MC squared. Uh, for instance, in a Christian paradigm, they'll use a technical language, uh, sin, redemption, salvation. Those are terms that do not appear in a materialist paradigm, but they will appear in a Christian paradigm. So these are technical language. And they'll appear in a Christian paradigm, but they won't appear in a Buddhist paradigm. So we get some general idea of this. Shared values. Uh, this is an interesting one because in the uh, materialist paradigm, uh, it's actually very hard to uh, come by values. It's one of the critiques of the materialist paradigm. It's very hard to, uh, to deduce values from it. But within, let's say, a scientific community, there are shared values. Uh, the scientist values honesty in reporting the results of research or experiments. This is extremely important because scientists depend on each other's research, and so if there's honesty in reporting, you can rely on the research that somebody else did. That's a value. Scientists also have aesthetic values. They tend to, uh, to go for theories that are simple and elegant rather than messy and complicated. There's now no objective reason why the universe has to obey simple theories uh, that are ele elegant rather than complex and messy theories. It's, it's just a, a slight value that scientists share. Uh, uh, Jews and Christians uh, both actually share the Ten Commandments as a set of values, for instance. Uh, Buddhists have five basic lay precepts that apply to the lay people in Buddhist cultures. Let's see if I can remember them. Uh, not to lie, not to steal, not to kill, not to get intoxicated, and not to commit uh, sexual misdeeds. And if you're a monk or nun, you start building up more and more precepts. You get to like 101 or something like in the Theravada tradition. But these are different sets of values that follow from the paradigm, the overall paradigm. And finally, we have exemplars. And uh, exemplars are usually the founders of the paradigm. And they're the ones who did things in a certain way that the <laughs> subsequent generations of people who are committed to this paradigm try to emulate. So again, a good example from the uh, materialist paradigm is uh, Newton. Newton was a great exemplar for physicists, at least all through the 19th century, continues to be today, actually. He, he uh, formulated the scientific theory the way it comes down, I mean, the, the scientific method the way it comes down to us. And if you are, as the beginning student in physics, uh, you learned the kinds of experiments that he did and the scientists who came after him did, and then that is your model for how you are going to do experiments. So then you go out and you try to 
not necessarily replicate their experiments, although probably a lot of you actually in high school, if you took any science classes, you were replicating <coughs> experiments that had been done by Dolphin or somebody to establish the uh, existence of oxygen or whatever. Uh, this applies, though, beyond just science. If you're a Buddhist, Buddha is your exemplar. You do, you do what Buddha did. Buddha outlined a path that he took, and so Buddhists follow that path. Uh, if you're a Christian, uh, you imitate Christ. That's uh, one of the fundamentals of it. You try to live as close as you can to a life that Christ lived. So the exemplars are the founders, but they also continue a presence within the paradigm as sort of models. So we could say that all these five factors that go into a paradigm provide a map of reality for a community scientific or otherwise, Kuhn was just talking about scientific communities, but I think you can extend it to any community, a map of reality for a community to follow in the conduct of its affairs, whatever its affairs may be. So that this is my sort of fundamental uh, definition of a paradigm, or at least it's a description of what goes into it. Now, there are a couple other important factors in paradigms. One is that they tend to be hierarchically nested. <coughs> so that, uh, for instance, within the whole field of science, the fundamental paradigm is physics, the determining paradigm. And then another field of science, chemistry, is based on physics. It rests on the paradigms of physics. And then the paradigms of biology, this is now establishment biology and chemistry, so it rests on the paradigms of chemistry, which rests on the paradigms of physics. So you can have a terms, in effect, the language that apply to biology that you won't find in physics, but you won't find anything in establishment biology that contradicts the laws of physics. So you won't have any other forces at work other than matter, energy, and physical forces in any sort of establishment biology paradigm. They won't accept a force of, let's say, chi energy, which is part of an Asian paradigm of how biology works. But, but if we understand paradigms, we begin to understand why there's this resistance to you know, just accepting anything. Again, I'm not taking sides here. I'm just trying to describe, right? So these paradigms are nested, and they're related to each other. So the idea is we won't find contradictions uh, between one set of paradigms and another at, at various levels at which we're operating. Uh, the second thing is stable societies tend to, by the way, I, I use this word tend to because, of course, in practice, practice is a lot more messy than the ideal, and we'll find overlaps and exceptions and so forth. But stable societies tend to have a dominant, what I call, cosmological paradigm. The, the most general, the most overall paradigm that, that has the most fundamental, really fundamental assumptions. Now, the dominant cosmological paradigm will be the dominant cosmological paradigm of the governing elite, not necessarily the masses, interestingly enough. So, for instance, in uh, ancient Greece, uh, well, ancient Greece was in a paradigm crisis. There were a lot of paradigms being put forward. I'm talking about the Greek period of Plato and then Aristotle and so forth. The uh, dominant, uh, the ruling class uh, was interested in what is going to be the paradigm. The masses were still, uh, you know, heathens worshiping various gods and whatnot. But the uh, ruling class had gone beyond that, and they were the ones who determine the rules of the society. So that's the paradigm that rules the society. And then the third factor that's important, that this was really the heart of Kuhn's book, is that periodically there are paradigm revolutions. That there are inconsistencies between the map and the terrain. And these inconsistencies start to show up. And no matter how much you fiddle with the map, you can't solve them. Because in, in practice, you know, we're always fiddling with the map. We're always adjusting the paradigms. These aren't set in stone. But at some point, you keep fiddling with the paradigm, and you can't adjust it. You can't solve these inconsistencies. 
and we have a paradigm crisis, as Kuhn called it. And then we have to go back and throw out the map and start all over. And this was Kuhn's big insight, his big uh, uh, thesis in terms of how science develops. Unlike most of us who were brought up to think of science developing as you know, building on the work of previous scientists and so forth. And he says, no, it's not really happening that way. And a good example is the revolution that Einstein caused when he introduced the theory of relativity and supplanted classical mechanics. And it's deceptive because a lot of the terms stay the same. So in classical mechanics, you talk about space, time, and gravity. And you still talk about space and time and gravity. But the referent of those words has changed radically from Einstein to from classical mechanics to Einstein. So gravity is, is really the most interesting one because today we still, most of us still think in classical mechanical terms. We're brought up that way. If you took some you know, basic sort of physics or uh, pre-physics uh, class in high school, we're, we're brought up to believe that gravity is a force. It sort of emanates out of bodies. It's a force that holds everything together. So the moon, uh, goes around the Earth by the force of gravity that holds it in this orbit. It's very useful to think of that way, and if you watch the news about rocket launches and stuff, they're talking about escaping the gravitational field and this and that, and uh, they talk this way, and it's understandable, but in Einstein's view, it's not like that at all. Gravity is the structure of space. There's no force whatsoever. So when the moon goes around the Earth, it's simply following the curvature of space created by the presence of the Earth. And a very crude analogy is the way a, uh, a golf ball, uh, you know, goes around the cup before it drops in because of the shape of the terrain around the cup. So it spins around and drops in. Eventually, the Earth is going to spin around and drop in. I mean, the moon is going to spin around and drop into the Earth. So these are radically different a shift in the fundamental <laughs> assumptions about what's going on here. So that's just an example of how that happens. Now, this is background material. Uh, a lot of background material. Now we come up to the present. <clears throat> and the dominant paradigm of the modern Western civilization, at least for the last 150 years or so, has been materialism. Notice that it is not necessarily the dominant paradigm in any particular country. I think it's fair to say it certainly is the dominant paradigm in Europe, but in America, it's not necessarily the majority paradigm. That the uh, most Americans, I think, are not strictly speaking materialists. Most Americans are Christian or have some uh, sense of some religious uh, view of the world. But we can tell it's the dominant paradigm of our of our society because, for instance, the courts only accept scientific evidence based on materialist paradigm. So uh, they don't accept uh, other sorts of evidence based on other paradigms. So if there's a murder and you bring in a, uh, a tape that was recorded on a security camera, that shows who committed the murder, that's admissible evidence in the court. Robert mentioned earlier that uh, there's going to be some class on distance viewing. Both you. Okay. Uh, you notice if you uh, have a somebody who's good at remote viewing and they saw who committed the murder and they want to come testify, <laughs> it won't be admissible in the court. Why won't it be admissible? Because the court is working off a materialist paradigm. So this is, uh, uh, I think, fair to say that the intelligentsia, the intellectual elite of West, the Western world for the last 150 years, has been operating based on a materialist paradigm. We see it show up in, uh, in uh, medicine. We see it show up in uh, education. That's why nobody wants to have creationism taught in public schools, funded by public uh, money and so forth. So, <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Thomas Kuhn himself recognized back in 1961 that there is 
a problem with this materialist paradigm. And here's what he wrote in Structures of Scientific Revolutions. Today, research in parts of philosophy, psychology, linguistics, and even art history all converge to suggest that the traditional paradigm, i.e. materialism, is somehow askew. And I think most of you are aware of this, otherwise you wouldn't be here at an IONS meeting, because IONS is precisely uh, established because there's the sense that there's something wrong with the reigning paradigm. We need to do something else. There are inconsistencies. The, the map no longer really matches the terrain. And no matter how much we fiddle with the map, we still have these anomalies showing up that cannot be explained. So we have this crisis. We are in the middle of a uh, paradigm crisis, as Hume, uh, uh, Hume would call it. As the Chinese say, you know, we live in interesting times, and that's a curse, <laughs> not, a, not a blessing. But it's also very exciting, isn't it? That's why uh, I think most of you are here, because it is exciting. So, now this is my contention. Uh, I'm not the only one in the world that invented this, but uh, my contention is that the crisis, we can pinpoint the source of the crisis, let me put it that way, as being a problem of drawing a boundary between the subject of experience and the objects of experience. And this is a problem that is showing up in virtually all our departments of knowledge, all our fields of research. And this problem is contradicting a fundamental assumption of the materialist paradigm. And that's why we're in trouble. So I'm sort of saying it can all boil down to this one thing. So this part is, this is where I'm going out on a limb here. Everything else I've been saying is June and other people. Who want so what is this problem? The materialist paradigm says there is a real boundary between the subject of experience and the objects of experience. It actually exists out there between self and world, I and other, however you want to phrase it, however it shows up. That there is a, an objectively existing world out there that is independent of my thoughts about it. No matter what I think, it just goes on being what it is. Now, this assumption is fundamental to the materialist paradigm. It's fundamental to the scientific method. The scientific method uh, works the validity of it because theories, according to the materialist paradigm, don't create facts or alter facts. They simply describe relationships between facts. The facts are there, and then the theories relate them in various ways. Here's what Einstein said about this. The belief in an external world independent of the perceiving subject, is the basis of all natural science. Now, notice, it's interesting. He said the belief. This is not something that you can prove by the scientific method. The scientific method uh, uh, works because you assume this is true. That's why it's one of these fundamental assumptions. <clears throat> and yet, what I'm saying is that research in various fields says, well, wait a minute, something's wrong here. We can't really establish this boundary. Where is this boundary? We go look for this boundary and we can't really find it. So let me just take a few examples to give us a taste, and that's all I can do tonight in this very short time, to give us a taste of what we're talking about from a few fields. In the social sciences, I'm talking about sociology, anthropology, psychology, and so forth. Social scientists assume that there is a boundary between the culturally created products 
of human societies and the objective facts of things like the environment and biological processes, right? So, for instance, religions, rites, rituals, prayers, philosophies, moralities, all that stuff, they're culturally created from the point of view of a social scientist. But the environmental factors, like climate, terrain, and things like that, they're not socially constructed, they are objective. And the biological processes, uh, diseases that people are subject to and so forth, these aren't uh, culturally constructed, they are uh, objective facts. So an anthropologist going out and studying a group of people, oh, they're very interested, they want to record their you know, their moral codes, and they write that down, and what their religious beliefs are, and then they note things like, well, these people have been decimated by smallpox in the past. That's their explanation of what's going on. It's not necessarily the people's explanation of what's going on that they're studying. Their explanation may be that there's a, that the white man brought a demon spirit along that's decimated them, and not necessarily smallpox. So this is just a, an assumption in the social sciences that there is this boundary between the subjective cultural products and then the objective factors in the environment. But isn't this boundary itself a product of the culture that the anthropologist is coming from? You see what I mean? So let's take an example. You mean the anthropologist brought the smallpox? No, the anthropologist <laughs> brought the boundary between the, uh, that distinguishes between the, what's subjective oh, and what is objective. Right. So the anthropologist says, well, all moral codes are products of culture, <clears throat> according to the anthropologist's uh, paradigm. But a religious fundamentalist of any tradition, by the way, just Christian or or Islam, or Jewish, or, or Hindu, doesn't think the moral code is a subjective creation of a culture. This is an objective fact of the universe. So we have a paradigm difference, and the way this line between subject and object is drawn is drawn differently according to different paradigms. Well, then the anthropologist might say, well, if you apply the scientific method you won't find any evidence of an objective moral code in the universe. But the fundamentalist says, well, I don't, okay, you have your scientific method, but revelation tells me that it is objective. So this is why truth criteria is important. One paradigm recognizes the scientific method as the determinant of valid knowledge. The other paradigm recognizes revelation. Never the twain shall meet. You know, this is why we are involved in these cultural wars today. This is a clash of two paradigms. And there is no paradigm-independent way to determine who's right or wrong. Because the criteria is built into your paradigm. So as long as we have a materialist paradigm and a fundamentalist religious paradigm, we're never going to solve issues like abortion and stuff like that. I mean, at least, I'm not saying there is necessarily a solution, but at least this helps us understand why these problems are so intractable. And why from one side, it's so obvious. The truth is so obvious. And from the other side, it's not. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, let's look at history. I mean, history must at least deal with an objective. <laughs> And every uh, American child, for instance, was brought up, uh, at least I was, I, I think I speak for every American child, with the notion that Columbus discovered America in 1492. How many of you learned that in school? <laughs> There's anybody who didn't learn that? You didn't learn it? What date did he discover? <laughs> I learned it. America was already populated, the Europeans discovered it. Ah, very good. So there has been. Well, it wasn't uh, flat, as they thought. Very good. No, because this is how we amend the paradigm as we go. We keep messing with the map, you see. So you're right. And what's taught in school now is that, uh, well, first of all, that uh, this is the European discovery of America. 
because obviously Native Americans discovered it long before Europeans came along. And then there's even debate about, well, maybe Leif Erikson arrived in Newfoundland. So, you know, there are qualifications and qualifications. But uh, nobody disputes that 1492 was the date, the year that Columbus arrived here, okay? That is a fact. But is it? Not in the Jewish calendar, is it? <laughs> no, it's not. In the Jewish calendar, it's 15, 50, I'm mean, sorry, 52, 53. Not in the Islamic calendar. In the Islamic calendar, it's 897. And if any of you are sticklers here for facts, I may be off a year or two, because the boundary that determines the new year from the old year is not the same in these calendars, slips around, so I don't know which side of the boundary. So within a year or two, this is accurate, right? So these are inventions, human inventions. These are subjective, these aren't objective facts. Calendars themselves are subjective inventions. And I don't want to go deep into this tonight, but if you investigate time itself, I think you will find it's a subjective invention. You can start with looking at hours, seconds, and so forth. So, wait a minute, where's, the, where's this line between the subjective and the objective? You see, we, we go look and it's hard to find. Let's look even now at the mechanics of perception itself. And there's been quite a bit of work done in the recent uh, few decades about how our perception itself works. And here's just one recent uh, experiment done by some researchers at the University of Michigan. Uh, Hana Fei Chua, C-H-U-A, it's a Chinese name, I'm sure I'm butchering it. By the way, I have a terrible pronunciation, I'm butchering all these names, so take that into consideration. Anyway, and Richard Nisbet, and they tracked the eye movements of Chinese students compared to American students looking at the same pictures. And what they found is American students pay more attention physically to foreground and Chinese students pay more attention to background. <coughs> so why is this difference? How would you explain it? Well, it's the culture they come from. It's the subjective factor. And this is what Professor Kyle Cave of the University of Massachusetts said about the import of this experiment. These results are particularly striking because they show that these cultural differences extend to low-level perceptual processes such as how we actually control our eyes. They suggest that the way we see and explore the world literally depends on where we come from. In other words, what culture we come from. So things that we take for granted as being objectively a fact, a truth, the way we see has subjective factors influencing it. Where do you draw the line between the subject and the object? Now we come to perhaps the fields, and there are other fields, by the way, in philosophy, which are very more complicated. I, I actually included a section. I said, oh, no, I don't want to get to that. Tonight. But you go investigate. I've just touched on a few little fields, but really in all the departments of knowledge. Any of you, let me just mention this. Any of you uh, are into deconstructionism, Derrida, and people like that in, in modern philosophy, it's all about this problem of reflexivity and where you draw the line between subject and object. So that's something you can look into. But the field that's perhaps most uh, interesting to modern people, because it's most persuasive, because it affects the paradigms of physics, which are the fundamental paradigms upon which all the other paradigms I nested, is quantum mechanics. Now let me read to you what the physicist John Bell said. Now I, I have to, I'm going to stop here and preface this. These physicists that I'm quoting and these ideas that I'm throwing out are not new age interpretations of quantum mechanics. This is hardball establishment quantum mechanics. I'm going to point out when there's a philosophical interpretation, 
But all of this comes from Nobel laureate prize winners and so forth. So, and, I, and this doesn't come from me. I am not a physicist. I don't do quantum mechanics. You know, I sat at the feet of Amit Goswami. I lived with him for two years, and we stayed up until midnight every night drinking beer and talking. So I feel like I got a graduate education in quantum mechanics and the philosophy of quantum mechanics because I don't do the math and so forth. But this is, this is, the, and this is even weirder, the fact that this is, quote, establishment physics. So here's what John Bell said. He, if any of you know anything about quantum mechanics, he was the author of Bell's Theorem, which is a very, very important theorem of quantum mechanics. He says, the subject-object distinction is indeed at the very root of the unease that many people feel in connection with quantum mechanics. Some such distinction is dictated by the postulates of the theory, but exactly where or when to make it is not prescribed. So we're coming down here to this problem again of the boundary between subject and object, the distinction between subject and object, self and world. And what he's talking about is the measurement problem. I want to just ask you, how many of you heard of the measurement problem in quantum mechanics? Anyone here from other Yeah, yeah, good. Okay. Well, if you know about it, then this is old hat to you, but it never hurts to go over it again because it's always mystifying. Uh, and for those of you who've never heard about it, if you don't understand what I'm talking about, don't worry about it for now. Just these kinds of ideas you get exposed to over and over again, and you still don't get it. In fact, I'm going, to, I'm going to digress from it to tell you a very quick story about um, Richard Feynman, who was one of the great American physicists of the 20th century. And he once gave a talk to some laymen uh, in New York, and he was going to give a talk about quantum mechanics. And he said, at the end of this talk, he said, uh, you're not going to understand anything about quantum mechanics. And he said, the reason is, where I teach at Columbia or wherever it was, uh, I, I teach quantum mechanics to my graduate students. And he says, they don't understand quantum mechanics. And he says, and they don't understand quantum mechanics because I don't understand quantum <laughs> <laughs> So, really, don't feel bad. Don't feel like you're a dummy if you miss it. But it's still kind of fascinating. Um, anyway, quantum mechanics, well, let's, we have to start with classical mechanics. That's the mechanics of Newton. The mechanics, if you took physics at all in high school, the chances are that was the mechanics you were taught. It is, and I'm being, uh, I'm oversimplifying all this just for the sake of understanding here, but uh, pardon me for that, but I, I still think there's a value in doing that. Classical mechanics deals with trajectories. So I fire a cannon, and the cannonball flies out of the cannon's mouth, and it travels through time and space, and it plops down on the Earth at some point out here. And because I have the tools of classical mechanics, the equations, if I know the various forces operating on this cannonball, I can predict where it's going to be at every moment in time until it plops down. It's being uh, you know, uh, acted on by gravity, the wind factors, and all that stuff, At atmospheric pressure. I can take all that into account, and I can predict where it is. And it is assumed to be actually there, objectively, going through space and time. Quantum mechanics does not do that at all. Quantum mechanics, of course, was developed looking at subatomic particles, photons, and electrons, and things like that. But it does not describe trajectories of <coughs> subatomic particles. It describes a way of probability of where I will find that particle should I go look at a particular time. And I've drawn this, this wave of probability right here on the board, probability wave. Uh, some of you who know something about quantum mechanics have heard of the wave particle duality and stuff like that. But one of the things that's very hard for us to get is this wave that they're talking about is not a physical wave, it's a mathematical wave of probability. And a lot of people spend, you know, spin their wheels uh, trying to resolve a physical wave and particle, but it's not even a physical wave at all. It's a mathematical wave. It says that, okay, I have an electron and an electron gun, and I shoot that electron, I'm speaking kind of figuratively, but I shoot it, 
And it says, if I go look at it in five seconds, the probability is very high that I'll find it here. And it usually matches where more classical mechanics would predict that find it. But there's a still a probability that I'll find it over here, over here, over here, over here. And the farther away, the probability gets lower, but it's still possible. All the way out to the ends of the galaxy, all the way out to the ends of the universe. It's very, very low probability, but I could still find that electron out there. And in the meantime, when I'm not looking, the electron isn't or cannot be described as following a trajectory. I'm just looking away, I don't see it. It is what in uh, physicists call a state of coherent superposition. I'm not going to try to define that word. <laughs> Except to say, all of these probabilities pertain. It's, it's in a certain sense in all of these states. It's everywhere. Or as Heisenberg, Werner Heisenberg, one of the founders of quantum mechanics says, it's in a state of potentia. It doesn't actually have a physical existence. Now, here comes the measurement problem. It's a wave of probabilities. It's in this coherent superposition. But when I go look, boom, it's a particle. It's there at this point in time and space. Pop. Now, this is what is known as collapsing the wave function. This wave is gone because if, I, if it's there, this end of probabilities. You know, if there's a 50-50 a chance my horse will come in and win the race, as soon as the horse comes in and wins the race or loses the race, the probability is gone. There's no longer a 50-50 chance the horse can win. If it came in last, that's too bad. You know, I lost my money. So what happened to this wave, and how did it get to be a part? This is the measurement problem. So uh, what collapses the wave function? Now, do you know the wave was ever there? Well, this is what quantum mechanics says. I don't. I'm taking the word of Schrodinger and Heisenberg and Richard Feynman and all these great physicists. Uh, and I, I mean that. These aren't just, this is standard physics. This is. Uh, not something that the New Age philosophers have come and tried to interpret. This is just the way physics is done today. So, um, the standard model, when that means, the, I think it's fair to say, the way that uh, most physicists, operating establishment physicists, look at it today, uh, was devised by some of the founders of, phys of physics. And they said, well, what, uh, what it is is the measuring device that we use. That's what collapses the wave function. So, for instance, a Geiger counter. In fact, I forgot to ask you this, Tom. What do you call a particle of radiation? A quantum. A quantum? Good, very good. See, it's just another word for particle. But it sounds better, doesn't it? So, if I, uh, you've seen the movies. Uh, they're looking for their radioactive bomb coming into the port in the container, right? which they're not spending any money to try to find. But they go with a Geiger counter, and so now we know that's hot. There's radioactive material in that. Every dit is a quantum of radiation that's registered like a particle. Before I heard the dit, that was a wave, a wave of probability that I would find that quantum there with the Geiger counter. So the Geiger counter is what collapses the wave function. I put the Geiger counter out, and dip, it collapses. Except there's a problem with this. That uh, one of the early uh, founders of quantum mechanics discovered, or noted, and that is the Geiger counter itself is made out of what? Subatomic particles. There's nothing in a Geiger counter but Electrons, photons, neutrons, all that stuff. But with the wave, which is which is collapsed into a solid when you pick up the Geiger counter and turn the switch. <laughs> but the Geiger counter is a bunch of waves. The Geiger counter is made up of what? Of all these subatomic particles, all of which are in wave mode. Because mm -hmm. there's, there's no 
other substance in the Geiger counter, you know? And in fact, the whole cosmos is made up of nothing but subatomic particles. <laughs> there is nothing else. I mean, according to this paradigm. So wh why does the Geiger counter, how does the Geiger counter get collapsed is the question. What collapses the Geiger counter? I find the Geiger counter here, but the Geiger counter is, is described ultimately by the same wave of probability that it's probable I'll find it there. A separate number of our Redkins and Merenkins who from the Geiger counter. A number of what? <laughs> Rankins in the Rankin tube in the guide card, it has a fixed uh, amount of uh, radioactive material, and if you separate that radioactive material, if you add more to it from the outside, it then uh, reacts. But before we even turn the Geiger counter on, how come the Geiger counter is collapsed? How come this podium is collapsed? So it you want to say there's some consciousness involved? Well, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah, you get ahead of it. Some people say that. I'm not saying it. But don't, let's not jump the gun here. Yeah. Yeah. It's like telling the, the punchline to the joke. OK. So this is the problem. What collapses anything? Not just the subatomic particles, because there's nothing else, see? So, uh, and this is, you know, this is, this is the weirdness of quantum mechanics. You parked your car out there in that space. You think it's sitting out there. It's not sitting out there according to quantum mechanics. It's described by a wave of probability. The probability is extremely high that you're going to find your car where you parked it, fortunately. <laughs> Unless some thief comes along and steals it. But it's actually, it's a non-zero possibility that it will be over the next part in space or the other side of the galaxy. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's possible in quantum mechanics. It's, it's so extremely improbable that it's never going to happen in the life of the universe, probably. Probably. But we always have to say probably, but it's not impossible. So what collapses the wave function if the, uh, it's not a some uh, measuring device, some macroscopic measuring device? Well. Uh, Schrodinger, Erwin Schrodinger, who, who came up with the equation that is now sort of the defining equation of quantum mechanics, himself did not like this. Yes, he did not like this one bit. And he devised a thought experiment to show how ridiculous it was, how ridiculous quantum mechanics was. And it is according to the materialist paradigm. And this is the point, see? This is one of these inconsistencies. The map is not matching the territory in a serious fundamental way here. So, how many of you have heard of Schrodinger's cat? Oh, most of you have. Okay. So, I'm going to go through it one more time <laughs> to illustrate, though, perhaps every time we go through this, we see often something else about it, to illustrate the problem of where to draw the boundary that Bell talked about between the subject and the object. So, let me step over <coughs> here. And I have drawn a little diagram on the board of the Schrodinger's cat experiment. And uh, just as Ahmet always does, I have to warn you that this is a thought experiment. They never really kill the cat to do it. So, who the cat's still alive? What? The cat's still alive. Uh, well, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 you can't even say it's dead either. <laughs> so, we take some radioactive material. And we put it in this box. This is a whole closed-in box. It's got a door. It's open at the moment, but we're going to close the door later. And this radioactive material has a... Uh, the chances of it decaying in, let's say, 10 minutes are 50-50. And decaying means it's going to send out a quantum of radioactivity, right? So uh, at the end of 10 minutes, there's a 50-50 chance that this radioactive material has decayed and has sent out a quantum. We also have in the box a detector for this radioactive material. So if it does decay at the end of 10 minutes, oh, I'm sorry. We then, we, no, I, I'm going to describe what is in here and then we shut it off. So if it does detect this decayed uh, radioactivity, then it triggers a hammer that breaks a bottle that contains poison gas. And there's a cat in the box. And actually, I see I should have drawn this cat. And I came with a 
Sad. Half happening, half sad. Wow. Because there's a, so there's a 50-50 chance that this is going to happen, a 50-50 chance that the poison bottle will be broken, so a 50-50 chance that the cat will die. So at the end of 10 minutes, there's a 50-50 chance that the cat's alive and dead. Except, you see, in front of the mechanics, it's not like the cat is really alive or dead, and we just don't know. The cat is in a coherent superposition. It's half alive and half dead. <laughs> that, this is the weirdness, that's right. Your mind is not gonna figure it out. Another thing uh, uh, Richard Feynman said to his students, he said, don't try to figure this out. You'll go right down the tubes if you try to figure it out. <laughs> we put the situ we put the cat in and the poison bottle and the hammer and the radioactive material. We close this up and we wait 10 minutes. So now the cat is 50% alive and 50% dead. It's in this quantum state of coherent superposition. So now, first of all, the, the uh, main part of this experiment is to show that these effects, we cannot confine these effects to just some subatomic realm, that they affect all of reality, macroscopic effects. But now we open the uh, door, and we either see a live cat or a dead cat. Now, if we examine what happens here, we see that uh, light photons come out of the box. This is according to the materialist paradigm now. They come out of the box, but they're in a uh, coherent superposition. They haven't been collapsed. Nothing's collapsed them. They hit our eyes, but our eyes are in a coherent superposition, right? They jiggle the uh, nerves and they send this electrical electrons back to the brain, but all that's still in a coherent superposition. The brain itself is in a coherent superposition. And if you want some, this is my little uh, experiment, if you want some little idea of what a coherent superposition feels like, which you're never going to know intellectually what it is, it's when you're in that state of absolute doubt. You have no idea what's going on. Now your brain is in a coherent superposition. It has a collapse one way or another. Okay? So what then collapses the brain? And some uh, physicists and serious physicists and philosophers have proposed that consciousness is what collapses the wave function. But this is terrible for a materialist because we said materialism, there's only matter, energy, and physical forces. Consciousness itself is really an epiphenomenon. It does not really exist. It's some sort of strange effect of, of these material processes going on in the brain. So now we're introducing consciousness as a fundamental aspect of the universe. The universe cannot appear without consciousness. Now, I'm not even defending this. I'm just saying that this is a one radical proposal to solve this problem of where to draw the line between subject and object. So this draws the line between consciousness and all the uh, phenomena in the world. That's where the line is drawn. You following that? In, in all fairness, um, I do have to say that uh, there is one other major uh, contender, uh, uh, competitive theory, and it's called the many worlds theory. How many of you ever heard of the many worlds theory? There are a few others, but this is really the other major one. And again, a lot of serious establishment philosophers and physicists buy into the major world theory. And the, the thing about the major world theory is to uh, sorry, the many worlds theory is to say, we got to keep consciousness out here. This is ridiculous. You know, we can't bring consciousness in. This destroys the materialist paradigm. So the way we'll look at this is that every possibility is actually happening. So the electron is, when I look at it, it's here, but it's also at every other place it could be on the continuum of its possibilities in some other universe, in some other world. So I'm, I'm here and I'm leaning on my right leg. In some other world, I'm leaning on my left leg. Yeah. In some other world, I got into a traffic accident I never made it here. And you guys are entertaining yourself with jokes or something. You know what I mean? So uh, every single possibility. And they, if it's 
physically possible is happening. And there are infinite possibilities. Because, first of all, notice that each point on this continuum represents a possibility. And they're infinite points. So uh, a lot of people don't really like this uh, solution because it's kind of messy and complicated. To solve one problem, the measurement problem, to invoke infinite worlds branching out in every moment of experience just to solve this. It's not, you know, scientists don't like, that's not that simple, elegant solution. It's a, a very messy, complicated solution. So that's, that's the, the pros and cons of that. We, we keep consciousness out, but it's this very messy solution. But there's another problem with it, that we haven't escaped where to draw boundaries. And this isn't so much the boundary between subject and object, but notice that there are no boundaries between the points of this curve. If we, uh, in the mathematics, does not describe any boundaries here. If we want to say there are many worlds, we have to come in and draw a boundary. We have to make a cut between two points. This is already a huge problem in mathematics, you know. What's, where do you draw the line between two points, zero dimensional points that are next to each other on the line? Uh, but we can come in and imagine some sort of boundary between them, but this is us subjectively projecting. The mathematics of quantum mechanics doesn't prescribe where that boundary would be. We're doing it to save mathematics, to save quantum mechanics from introducing consciousness. So we have this, we may be escaped consciousness, but we haven't escaped the fact that we are still having to draw the boundary. It's still a subjective act that we are doing. Is everybody following this a little bit? Okay. So, now, um, here is then the problem, the crisis, the paradigm crisis that we're facing. So, the last thing I just want to in interject here is maybe we should look at a different place for a possible way out of this crisis. And if we look at the mystics of all the world's traditions, and we ask, what do they have to say about this boundary between subject and object, maybe we will get an insight, a new way of looking at this that we haven't thought of before that might lead to a whole new, uh, whole new paradigm. Okay? So, I have to spend one moment very quickly defining what I mean by the mystics. The mystics are the men and women of all the world's great religions. That's uh, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, slash Confucianism, who have claimed, claimed, I'm not, again, <coughs> defending this necessarily, but have claimed to have had a direct apprehension of the nature of ultimate reality via a third way of knowing, which is neither intellectual, conceptual, theoretical, or experiential. Now, the first part is easier to understand, this is our, at least we know what it isn't, it's not about theories, thoughts, concepts, but what does this mean that it is not experiential? <coughs> and sometimes, because mystics will talk about it as an experience, because it's closer to experience. Experience has an immediacy that intellectual and, and theories and concepts don't have. But strictly speaking, it's not experiential in our normal way of using the term experience. And there are two things about the way we normally use the term experience. First of all, it is ephemeral. All our experiences pass. So this is a way of knowing that doesn't pass. So that's important. It transcends time. It's not like it goes on forever, it's just outside of time altogether. The second, uh, and more important for our purposes, distinction is that when we talk about experience, we usually mean what? Something that's happening with a built-in subject-object duality. So I have an experience. I, you know, I went to uh, uh, Spain a couple summers ago. And a wonderful experience in Spain. I know something about Madrid. I have experienced Madrid. You know, we talk this way. It's like I have an experience. There's this duality built in. So this is a way of knowing, a direct way of knowing that 
does not have this duality built in. So technically, sometimes it's called knowledge through identity, that you are what you know, and what you know is what you are. So that's, that's my definition of uh, mysticism here. It's a quite restricted and classical definition of mysticism. It does not include a lot of other stuff like uh, paranormal phenomena and distance viewing and whatnot, which may or may be legitimate and valid, but that is not necessarily part of what this core idea of mysticism is about, the way I'm talking about. Uh, this uh, third way of knowing in, in every culture, every religion, they have their own a uh, local term for it, for instance, maybe some of you are familiar with the term Satori or Kensho in Zen. Uh, Jinana is used by Hindus and some Buddhist traditions. Uh, uh, Marifa is from the uh, Sufi Islamic, uh, the Sufis of the mystics of Islam, they use the term Mar Marifa. Uh, realization, recognition, union with the divine, that's the idea of knowledge through identity. Uh, gnosis, gnosis is an old Greek word used by uh, Plato and the Greek mystics and then taken over by early Christian mystics. Uh, that's a word I like to use. Uh, but in any case, whatever the word is from these different uh, traditions and different uh, cultures, it points to the same thing. Points to, I say, because, as we're going to see in a moment, this is really beyond description, since it's beyond concept. Then, the mystics often talk about reality as being non-dual. This ultimate reality is non-dual. But you see, even this falls short because it creates a boundary between non-duality and duality. So what is a non-dual that transcends the boundary between duality and non-duality? That's the question. So, uh, <laughs> this is too much for you, you might want to check. <laughs> so what mystics claim is, you see that all these distinctions, all these boundaries are imaginary. Here's what uh, the great Christian mystic Meister Eckhart says. If we will see things truly, they are strangers to goodness, truth, and everything that tolerates any distinction. They are intimates of the one that is bare of any kind of multiplicity or distinction. Again, this one and it's, uh, it has free of these <coughs> distinctions, free of boundaries. In particular, this reality is non-dual and the boundary that we create between subject and object is imaginary. Now, I'm going to read you about four or five quotes here from different uh, mystics, from different traditions, from different times, different places. Notice how precisely the same they are. When I say the mystics are talking about the same thing, it's not just that, oh, we're all children of the one and everything's nice and all that. It's quite precise. Here's the Zen master Wang Po. A perception, sudden as blinking, that subject and object are one, will lead to a deeply mysterious, wordless understanding. And by this understanding, you will awake to the truth of that. Subject and object are one. Uh, here's the Taoist sage, Chong Tzu. Chuan Tzu. Heaven and earth were born at the same time I was, and the 10,000 things are one with me. The 10,000 things, the myriad creatures, these are Chinese idioms for saying everything in the cosmos, all of it. You know, that from the electrons to the galaxies. Here's the uh, Hindu uh, mystic uh, Shankara, the founder of uh, what is called uh, Advaita, which uh, some of you may be familiar with, uh, especially Western forms of, of Advaita that are very popular today. The illumined seers know him as the utmost reality, infinite, absent, without parts, the pure consciousness. In him they find that knower, knowledge, and known have become one. We were there, we were there in China with Buddhas and Taoism. We're moving away now to India. Okay, here's the Jewish Kabbalist, Abraham Abulafia. 
medieval Jewish Kabbos, the, the uh, Kabbos for the mystics and Jews. You shall then arrive at the intelligible, and you will find all these one. That is, the intellect and the object of intellection and the intelligible are all one. I mean, a Jewish Kabbalist and a Taoist sage? I mean, you, you could, you know, if I didn't tell you who was saying these things, you wouldn't know the difference. <coughs> and here's Ibn Arabi, one of the great Sufi mystics, mystics of Islam. You are an imagination, as is all that you regard as other than yourself, an imagination. Well, you see, this is quite precise, isn't it? This is a high degree of intersubjective agreement. This is exactly what we're talking about. So, now the final thing that all mystics have in common is they all say, don't take our word for it. Please don't take our word for it. If you just believe what we say, it will be an obstacle. We cannot tell you this truth because it cannot be put in words. If you want to know it, and there's no have to know it, if you want to know it, we have techniques that can help you discover it for yourself. Meditation, contemplative prayer, things like that. So if you want, we, are, uh, we have methods and so forth that will guide you to this realization for yourself. But you can verify it. And this is why we call our organization the Center for Sacred Sciences. Not, not that there's a, an absolute uh, uh, you know, identity between physical science and sacred science, but there is a parallel. And the parallel is science has theories, and there are experiments you can do to test and verify the theories. And mystics have teachings. And there are practices you can do to test and verify the teachings in your own experience, if you want to. But that's not what's material here tonight. The question for us is, what if we stop trying to find some objective boundary between <coughs> subject and object, and we took the mystic's insight on faith at their word for the moment as an axiom <coughs> for a new world view? that this boundary is imaginary, as are all boundaries. And we start to go from there. What would that look like? I, I don't know. I don't have a prediction of what that's going to look like. This is part of what the center is interested in. We have the center to foster new worldview, to explore this. I don't have a new worldview to offer you and go away with. But I can... Uh, I can predict, I will predict this, first of all, be radically different from what we have. Just like the shift from the Copernican, from the Ptolemaic worldview in, in astronomy to the Copernican. In the old Ptolemaic worldview, the Earth was the center of the universe, and then Copernicus came along and said, well, let's, let's assume the sun is. That's all I'm saying. We take this as an assumption for now. It can be verified by other means, but for our worldview purposes, we take it as an assumption. And I think that the worldview we will come up with will be as radically different as the uh, heliocentric worldview was from the old Earth-centric worldview. And not just in an intellectual way. If you go back and read some descriptions of medieval people of how they experience themselves in the universe, and then you compare that to your experience, it's really quite different. It's amazing how different. If you can imagine they step in their shoes. They lived in a very opposing little universe, basically. Uh, so I think it would be that different. And the other thing I think it will offer is <coughs> a chance, a chance for a rapprochement between science and religion, at least mysticism as a religion in terms of mysticism, and a way out of these cultural wars, this deadlock. Because this will be, it won't be a materialist worldview, and it won't be a fundamentalist uh, uh, religious worldview. It'll be something else. And maybe from that, we can have shared truth criteria, uh, language. And by the way, one of the things that we work on at the center is we believe that uh, mathematics can express mystical truths and scientific truths. So we could have a, a single language that expresses both of these. Uh, shared values, which are very important to us in our daily conduct. And the people who come up with this will be the exemplars. A lot of them we already have, actually, because we'll carry over exemplars from science. People who are truly committed to science as a method and were open-minded, not people who are 
already committed to some materialist worldview and won't hear anything else. And also, uh, the great religious teachers of our, uh, our race, the Buddhas and the Lao Tzu's and so forth. So we'll inherit a lot. We don't have to throw everything away. But we'll see it all from a new perspective. So <laughs> that's how uh, the universal principles of mysticism relate to a new, new paradigm. Yes, and Robert. Uh, we're running out of time. We're out of time. No. So uh, anyway, thank you uh, very much for putting up this.